we're going to talk today about building the first interledger wallet, which we call Switch. And then we're going to do a demo sort of showing you how to use it, hopefully not breaking it spectacularly, um, and sort of go through the process of why we built it, why we think it's a good first product um, to kind of open source for the ILP community, and then sort of projects you might want to do on it and ways you might want to hack on top of it. We uh, both work at Kava Labs. We started working on ILP around February of last year, around the same time that kind of ILP was having this transition from ILP previous versions to v4. Um, and the way I describe that is like atomic transfers kind of became these bilateral credit agreements between peers. And that kind of enabled this new thing where settlement was completely abstracted away from the clearance of value. And that, to us, was actually a really interesting architecture because we'd been looking at sort of the interoperability space for blockchains and we're like, okay, this is something that makes sense because of the way that it doesn't assume very much between the two systems. And we saw how there was this proliferation of different systems coming into play and they were, it was very unlikely there was going to be a single uh, agreed upon standard uh, that required a lot of sort of shared primitives. Um, and so that was interesting to us. Uh, second, and I think Evan's gone into this a lot, there's a nice separation of protocol layers in ILP that resembles the internet. Uh, that makes it easier to build on and also makes sort of coming to standards and then stabilizing them a lot easier, which I think has already paid off um, as we've seen in ILP v4. Um, and then it's a novel solution to the atomic swap problem, uh, which we're gonna talk about for a second here. Do you wanna do that, Rui? Yeah, so ILP is pretty nice if you're dealing with atomic swaps. Currently, the, the kind of model for atomic swaps without ILP, without streaming payments in particular, is this kind of <coughs> cross-chain dumping swap um, lying entirely like on-chain, pretty much. The, the main problems that come up with this is the so-called free option attack. Yeah, I'll go through the, the rough kind of setup. So the idea with the atomic swaps is one person, Alice, would like to move Bitcoin from Bitcoin and swap it into Litecoin. She can do this with a hash time lock contract. So she locks up uh, currency for a particular amount of time, and that can be unlocked by anyone with the, the hash. And then on the other side, uh, currency is again locked up on Litecoin with the same hash, and this hash links together the two transactions such that uh, they're atomic. You can't have uh, one side go through, another, not the other side. If, if one side goes through, then that automatically allows the other side to go through. And so this is great for moving currency in large chunks until you actually think about it more and look at the differences in price between these things. This is where the free option problem comes up. So if you think about what's actually happening here, Alice is locking up Bitcoin for one for like a 40 hour, 48 hour time window. And Bob locks up uh, the equivalent in Litecoin for, so, uh, for like a slightly less amount of time. And now Alice is waiting. Now Alice basically has 23 hours worth of time in which to uh, make this trade happen. And the idea is that she has plenty of time to, to uh, submit the thing and accounts for any downtime or slowness and stuff. But what Alice should really do if she's thinking about things cleverly is that she should watch the price of Bitcoin to Litecoin. And if it goes in her favor, she'd go through, go through with the trade. If it does not, she'd just leave it. Time's out, money gets returned back to her. So this is basically an option. This is like a financial thing, and she's not paying for this privilege. So anyone who's offering these trades basically just loses out. So the way ILP um, solves this is it breaks things down to small payments. Basic intuition is uh, we take that big chunk that we were going to do all in one go uh, with a big timeout on it, and instead we chunk it down into arbitrarily small or large amounts. Uh, so like dreaming payments, quote unquote, like scale with trust. If I trust you 100%, I could do it in one chunk. Um, but what it does is these chunks have very short timeouts associated with them, and so we're minimizing the free option. And we're also playing this like cooperative game where it's like, it doesn't really make sense if I have a very small amount of value to float you, um, because if we keep cooperating and you keep sending more packets, I'm going to make money on fees or however like, the intended way of me to make money is. Um, and so we call that minimizing the free option. You get either a very small time window or sort of like there's no advantage for stealing that, that small amount. And then it allows just-in-time conversion between different cryptocurrencies. So, a lot of interoperability solutions uh, don't really think about the fact that you know, I might want to send something and interact with the system, but the receiver on the other end might actually need to receive a different asset. Um, ILP is a nice, and streaming in particular is a nice way of doing that where I can send Bitcoin out one side and literally the other side can receive Ethereum. Um, and some interactions need to be done that way. It can't just be credit or you can't be trading sort of like a wrapped version of these things. You have to be trading the underlying asset. Yes, sir. 
just want to uh, uh, make sure I'm understanding. Uh, this is assuming that both assets being traded are fungible and divisible, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, there's, you can do some interesting stuff for NFT type constructions, um, but generally, yeah, I, I restrict this to value transfer, not NFT. All right, so we looked at this and we're like, this is a really cool idea. It seems like the protocol itself is fairly uh, far developed. Uh, let's build something on top of it. And thought for a while, and the, the first product we really came to is like an inner ledger wallet uh, because it sort of has a lot of functionality that wallets want to have, but can do it in this decentralized, interesting way uh, that ILP enables, where you sort of have a peer to peer network in between you and the other currencies, and you can swap the currencies without using a single peer like Shapeshift integrated into a wallet. So the main idea is where let's hold the funds on layer two. So now we can have fast swaps whenever you log into your wallet, uh, and you can kind of feel like the money is ready to be spent as opposed to many transactions and a long time away. Um, Non custodial, but easy to use. So, this is a big one for us. Um, just giving a product that works for people. Um, when they hear about ILP, like we want them to have somewhere they can go, look at, and interact with in a way that makes sense to them, um, but is still non custodial and they can sort of choose the degree of trust that they want to associate with it. Um, and then good UX. Um, a lot of people come into ILP, they don't quite know where to go, don't know where to start. Um, it's nice if there's something that you know, has a good experience. So, now all we had to do was build it. All right, you want to talk about sort of the background? Yep. <clears throat> okay. So there's kind of a couple of pieces to this to the thing we built. There's a ILP SDK and then switch. So ILP SDK is a SDK for moving currencies between each other using ILP. The idea is it's pretty simple to use, pretty straightforward to set up. Uh, you don't need to know much about the internals of, uh, how, of how Interledger works. It should uh, just make things quite nice. And then the other part was the, the user interface switch, which we built on top of the SDK. We're making both open source, so everyone can use them. So we just released this here at Kava Labs slash switch, the live demo. All right, so if you go check out our repo, you'll see that there's one release. Uh, we cover the reasonable operating systems, uh, not very tested on Windows, so uh, can't guarantee that's going to work. Um, but we do have uh, an Apple image and uh, something for Linux as well. Uh, so you can download it from there, uh, drag it into your applications, um, and then load up switch. All right, so when you get there, uh, it asks you sort of like to configure an asset. And what this is doing in the background is making a connection to a connector and then having a payment channel between you and your connector um, so that you have like an available line of sending uh, on both sides. So this will go, and we can simultaneously open up an ETH one. And right now we've kind of got it on testnet only and it's sort of capped to small trades, um, but the idea is we're trying to get sort of iterative feedback here and uh, release this as something that people can play with. And so one of the big things that we sort of were focusing on in this is like when I have these two things loaded, I now have these nice looking cards, um, sort of like gives me a visual represent representation of a connection to a connector without having to know what an uplink is, without having to know what, the, what a plugin is. Um, and then I can close this app and come back and my money should still be there. And so now I'm sort of like ready to, if I have payments to make, I can like send them immediately through the connector. If I want to do a trade, I can immediately do that. Um, and sort of like the UX is better um, on sort of a per asset basis. So we go over here. And so we've got it set up right now where you can switch, send money from one ledger to another. And it's literally like going packet by packet through the connector. Uh, we've set like very small limits, so it's pretty slow right now. Um, but again, all of this scales this is sort of just like a general concept. Um, that's why we really like it. Go back the other direction, why not? Yeah, yeah, you can claim these balances at any time, um, which is sort of what's so cool about ILP and what it's enabling. So we just have a, a API in the back end of our connector that just pulls prices. I think it's coin cap right now. Does anyone want to see a lightning swap? I guess we can do that. It's, it's, a, it's a fun one to set up. Get your full nodes ready. You want to have a base64 encoded strings. Let's see if that works. 
Uh, um, what system is it that's using macaroons? Uh, L and D, which is the there's a couple of different versions of Lightning, but LND is the one developed by Lightning Labs, and it uses macaroons by default for authentication. So the macaroon is basically like your uh, private key. All right, let's try to go BTC to ETH. This one's definitely a bit of a knock on wood. Go small. Whee! 26 cents. That's not, that's not. <laughs> but yeah, that's sort of the basic overview of Switch. I uh, really encourage people to like check out the repos. They are open source. Please break it. Tell us what you like about it, what you don't. Fork it. You know, do new things with it. That's why we built it, and that's sort of like what we're most interested in about it. All right, any questions? Which token is next? ERC20s. So we've built an SDK for Interledger, which is all about the concept of an uplink, which is a connection between you and a connector. So right now we have our connector running against that. So you can imagine you could have many uplinks to many different connectors or many uplinks to one connector. Um, and it just exposes these methods, add uplink, uh, deposit to uplink, uh, withdraw from uplinks. And we represent all that as a card in the UI. Um, and then you can swap between uplinks. And that's like the basics of the, the uh, SDK. And when you say uplink, you mean plugin, or not really? So a plugin is a way of creating many uplinks between a client and a server. And one uplink represents a connection over a particular plugin. So like technically, I can use the same plugin and create two uplinks over ETH. And so they're, they're, they're not quite plugins. There's like one level further of abstraction, which is the uplink. And that's like what the UI is representing. So you're using your connector uh, to handle the liquidity between these. Yeah. How do you manage it if uh, you're going between multiple? Uh, I guess maybe is this only that you're funding your own wallet and that's it? Or could, if you're going to be sending it to somebody else that's on a different connector that may not have the same liquidity, how do you... Yeah, sure. So the question is, like, uh, if we have a connector in the background and I am using Switch or using that connector, how do I get payments across, say, to another connector or to someone who's not directly connected? Um, and the answer is, like, uh, it's the same assumptions as ILP generally. So if I'm peered with, say, Strata, uh, I can send to any of Strata's peers through our connector. And every exchange rate is a bilateral thing. And so I'm giving my peer an exchange rate. Strata is giving us an exchange rate. And I don't actually have to pass that down the line. Um, depending on like sort of what your business model is. But essentially, you can both be peering vert like linearly to go longer paths, or you can actually peer sort of horizontally and be like, I'm peered with Strata and Kava, and then depending on the rates, I send down whichever particular path, or if I can only use one path, I send down that path. But that's like the basic discovery, yeah. Two questions. One, where are you storing the keys uh, that, that you load into the wallet, and uh, why are you calling it a swap uh, can you elaborate on that? Why is it a swap? It feels like it's just from one point, point A to point B. Where's the swap? So the swap is a notion of like a shapeshift, is like a cryptocurrency swap. So it's to uh, disambiguate it from exchange. I can't do like a limit order with this. All I can do is swap A to B at whatever price I'm given in a back end. Um, and typically like products call that swapping in cryptocurrency, um, not the financial term for swaps. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the keys are stored locally on the machine, uh, right now unencrypted. <laughs> this is not on mainnet. Um, we, it will be encrypted using, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, you can't use this on mainnet right now. There's no connectors. Um, so we will uh, be encrypting the keys and sort of doing best practices for that, um, similar to like uh, Zap Wallet uh, for Lightning. Not security flaws, but like I'm trying to mitigate the ways that people could uh, so how's it been sort of trying to mitigate the attacks around this? Um, I think we've like arrived at sensible defaults, which is like if you keep the packets small and you don't extend any uh, serious credit between people, there's not a whole lot to attack. Um, and sort of we'll see what people get up to when we, when we release it. Um, but we don't have like a sort of great general analysis of like how people behave uh, against the system. Do you think there will be any difficulties on like the economic player? Like will you have certain pathways that are 
you know, you have a bilateral connection, right? But it's only really used one way, and you have to settle, you know, often because it doesn't balance out. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, do you see any problems that way? Yes. I mean, the short answer, <laughs> yes. Uh, better answer is like, if you had a common path, ILP is at least nice in that you can a do net settlement and b defer settlement. So it's not like you can't uh, sort of solve the problem. But if you just generically have a peer that you have very low trust with that you're always sending, you do need to be adding liquidity into that sort of channel in an inefficient way, I would say. Yeah. All right, thank you.